The Bike Karma Bicycle Stories podcast is brought to you with support from The Frame and Wheel, helping you turn your cycling items into cash without the hassle. And AD Bikes, the modern face of Ostra Daimler bicycles. Become bike, become AD Bikes. Oh hey, welcome to the special August beach edition of the Bike Karma Bicycle Stories podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brown. The mission of the show is to bring people from all over the world together to share bicycle stories and to make some connections. I hope just like riding a bike can take away your worries for a little while and bring you some joy, I hope this show can do a little bit of that too. Whether you're a novice or an expert, whether you enjoy wrenching, riding, or collecting the best, If you've ever smiled about a bicycle, you're in the right place. The stories in this episode range from fighting Nazis by bicycles back in World War II, to bird watching with a dog while mountain biking, and starting Black History bike tours down in Texas. You have a lot of podcasts to choose from, and I really appreciate you coming along for the ride with me. Let's roll out. Asking Joe Kermaski to share just one story is like trying to get just one spoonful of water from a lake. So when I had the honor of getting a chance to talk to him after having read all of his books, I found that there was just too much going on to keep it in one segment. I mean, I love that our interview went from, uh, you know, beloved Robin Williams to killing a Nazi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, he, he kind of <laughs> covered... You covered all my bases there for what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, Mork to Nazi killing, yes. There you go. So not so we 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 went we went a little more than Neapolitan. We went we we started a vanilla. And we started we started a rainbow with his suspenders, and we just went more colorful from there. I think that's part of why I liked reading his books so much. His cycling stories are like really good tapas. Deep, flavorful, thoughtfully produced. A perfect bite of insight into a cycling adventure. So this will be installment one of his storytelling, and you'll hear the rest a couple episodes down the line. In this part, we'll hear about his latest book, an illness that he battled while he was writing his latest book, how he got his nickname as the Metal Cowboy, and how I almost missed ever hearing about him. His latest book is a little bit different. It's not about his own cycling stories. It's about Evelyn Hamilton. Who is that, you say? Well, she was an amazing racer. And during World War II, she took her riding to the French resistance to fight Nazis with secret messages hidden inside of her handlebars and a small gun hidden in her hair. She helped to liberate France by bicycle. The only reason I would go back out at 54 years old is to get Evelyn's story out there. I'm telling a story that's not my own, Um, you know, Mm -hmm. and and we're we're all unreliable witnesses to history, but I've tried to do my best to get hers as, as fairly and accurately as I could. And I can't wait to get the world to see that, you know, because it's a hell of a story. Like, what the? Nobody told this story? And it's amazing how many stories there are like that from yep. history that just get lost in the sands of time. You know, when people have asked me on interviews, why do you think that is? And I said, you know, I would love to give you all kinds of, you know, gracious answers, but it was just plain old misogyny and sexism. If she had been a man, she'd be up there with all the war heroes that you hear about. Hey, this is Joe Kermaski. I'm from Portland, Oregon, a.k.a. The Metal Cowboy. So we pick up this story right where we were talking about making connections between people through storytelling. And it's all about communion, and I think that's part of what the bike's about, is about community. 
And for me, you know, the the other story, and it's not a story from the road. I mean, I have so many stories from the road. Dumpster diving with Sammy D and um, Acapulco and losing all my possessions in an Outback bar and having to win it back in a mountain bike race in Australia. They go on and on. We could do a whole hour, you know, we your whole American life with some of these stories. But the one that I would say, and it's not exactly a story, it's kind of, it's the story of how I get to keep telling stories, is that about five years ago, I was diagnosed with, maybe even longer now, six years ago, I was diagnosed with a genetic disorder that's the, the most common mis- and undiagnosed genetic disorder on the planet, and it, it takes more lives than diabetes and ALS and and a couple other of them combined. And the problem is is that it's just not diagnosed. So people die without knowing what killed them. Patrick Swayze, um, Steve Jobs, Ernest Hemingway. It presents the end case illnesses present as other things. But the underlying genetics disorder is called hemochromatosis. And what it is, and it's a big word to say, iron overload. At a certain point, it's a Viking mutation, and it was it was passed down successfully because it kept you healthy for the first 40 years of your life. But once the genetic mutation switches, turns on in your midlife, it forces your body to, to store any iron that's not more, more than its daily allowance. And so this stiffens your organs and your tissues and causes, you know, if untreated, uh, causes everything from diabetes to heart attacks to cirrhosis to... 30 or 40 different types of cancers. And so a lot of people dropped dead of it and they didn't know they had it. And I got lucky. I got diagnosed. And I tell, I tell this story because it was a long, hard road. I, the, the cure is, and there's no cure, but the, the way to, to get saved is through phlebotomies. It's real medieval. It's leeches, basically. You know, they bleed you. And um, you get bled um, once a week, once every 10 days until it brings your iron down. And it's not a blood disorder. It's a, It stores the iron in your organs and tissues. And basically, they're leaching it out by forcing your body to make new blood. And every time your body makes that new blood, it oxygenates it. And by oxygenating it, it pulls the iron out of the different organs and tissues. And so you slowly get drained of this, uh, leached of this iron. And then once you're in maintenance, you know, you go once every few months and, and you're good to go. But Along the way, it's a tough one to get trained every 10 days, and it opens you up for other illnesses. And so I was working on this really cool book, this book called Lightning in a Saddle, when I got diagnosed. I was busy doing the research, and Lightning in a Saddle is a story of Evelyn Hamilton. And the subtitle is The Long, Untamed Life of Evelyn Hamilton. And the book jacket would be that she's the female Jackie Robinson of the British bicycle racing world meets... Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. And I pitch that because I say that because she was this cycling phenom of the 20s and 30s. She was her record breaking, record setting rides and races were all documented, newsreels and everything else, but she wasn't allowed to race against the men, even though her times were right up there with the contenders of the Tour de France. In fact, she trained with the 1923 Tour de France winner, Henry Pelsier. And he's the one that gave me the title of the book. In a newsreel, he says to the whole audience that she's just set this thousand miles in 84 hours of in-saddle riding. He says, you know, gents, we're lucky they won't let her race in the Tour de France because the rest of us are plow horses and Evelyn's lightning in the saddle. And so that's where I got the title of the book. And that would be enough, you know, this book about this woman who lived and loved and rode on her own terms during a time when misogyny and sexism and button-down Britain wouldn't let her race against people that she really should have been in the right category with. That would have been enough. But then this regional war starts drying up all the races, and so she goes to France, becomes part of the sort of Cirque du Soleil ball of death on a bicycle, and she's working with the circus. And then the troops roll in, and they occupy France and uh, World War II. And instead of heading home, uh, sneaking out of France back to Britain, she goes deeper into France and joins the French resistance. And in her journals, it says, you know, why didn't you, um, why didn't you leave? And she said, well, I found out Hitler wasn't a cyclist, and I vowed to help bring him down. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
So it's this amazing book that I almost, almost, Tom, didn't get to write. I was, you know, 50% in, and I got sick. And then well, I dealt with the hemochromatosis side, and then some virus got in because I was immune suppressed. And that's when it got rough. That's when I went down. It ended in a five-year period. I lost, I lost my mom. I lost my sister. I lost my marriage. And I almost lost my life. But one thing I didn't lose was my will to see this book through. Because I, as I say in early in the book, if I died, Evelyn and her story, and this amazing piece of, of history, cycling and also equality pioneer and just beacon of humanity, if, if I died, Evelyn died twice. And so the bicycle doesn't always save or can't save you, but it damn well close to, it kept me going. I mean, even when I can only ride at a block, and some days not at all for a long stretch there, you know, I stayed in there. I stayed in the fight, and I bounced back. And at this point, it's just amazing to me to still be here, A. Every day for me is a bonus. I just chop the wood and carry the water. It informs all the things I do, um, enjoying what I do for the nonprofit that I manage, um, which is Washco Bikes. We have a community bike center, and uh, we give bikes, about a 1,000 bikes away to, to the needy every year and uh, summer camps and all sorts of great programs. And I still get to write, and I still get to ride. So happy to be here, happy to tell the story. But that's the story of how I get to keep telling the stories. Well, the book opens. Evelyn is working under an alias, running a bistro, which is a Gestapo hangout. She looked a lot like the the owner of the bistro who got blown up picking mushrooms. And so she's running this bistro. The waiters and waitresses listen into the Gestapo. They take down the information as if they were taking orders of food. They put it up behind the counter. Evelyn translates it into code, puts it in her handlebars, and rides it to drop points on her bike. She looks like a winsome young French woman out on a bike ride. This is deep in. This is 1943. So she's deep into this, and it's a, a vital information. She's riding along the French countryside in August, the back end of an incendiary afternoon. Just the whole place is in harvest mode of all the farms. And um, and she's looking down at one of those farms, and she comes up a hill that she remembers racing in a, in a race in 1938. She won 50 races in five countries over a short period of time. And so she remembers this one. As she gets to the top of the hill, there's a... Lone specimen of Hitler's army waiting there at a roadblock, machine gun down by his side. And she's not worried because, you know, she's pretty high up in the French resistance. She's got to, they print their own paperwork. She's not worried about her papers being good or she's got the information hidden in her handlebars. And she gets to the top of that hill and he looks at her papers for a few moments. Then he just smiles and says, Guten Tag, Gladys. And Gladys is her nickname from the British newsreels and from her time as a stunt double in um, Gracie Fields movies, Hollywood movies. And so she knows that somebody has sold her out. Instead of panicking or running or whatnot, she asks him for a cigarette. And he hands her the whole pack. And she does this to see how worried he is of her presence. And so they have this moment of mock civility smoking a cigarette together at the top of this hill. They're overlooking the farms that are paid for by the money pickpocketed from the ghosts of the gas chambers. And it's just awful. And she has to decide whether she wants to risk trying to get away or be interrogated, tortured, raped, killed, or sent off to the camps. But what he doesn't know is that Evelyn keeps a one-shot Derringer, one-shot pistol in the bun of her blonde braided hair. 
and she's practiced this so many times. Pull, draw, shoot. And she said in her journals, it's an entirely different animal in the wild. She knew what she was doing, but now, listen, 99 out of 100 of us faced with a man with a machine gun down by his side planning to take us in are, we're going to go in. We're going to go in quietly. Evelyn, Evelyn plays with her hair, talks with him, says, does it end here or later? And he doesn't answer the question. He blows a big smoke ring and looks at her and says, do I call you Gladys or Evelyn? And she says, well, my friends call me Gladys. Blows another long puff of smoke and says, Evelyn, it is then. So she knows where she stands. And she plays with that hair and waits for just the right moment. She's undoing her braid just a little. She can get a good grab of the gun, pistol. And she waits for him to look down and crush the cigarette out on the ground. She looks over her bike, thinks about all the miles left in her legs and all the finish lines that she was able to cross first and what she won't give for one more ride. And so she pulls, draws, and shoots. And then we go back to when she's 10 years old, and that starts the book with her brothers in the, uh, just outside of London, riding bikes to a swimming hole. Wow. So that's a little teaser. That's a good teaser. I thought you were going to leave me there a little bit more hanging, and it's, it, it, I'm glad you went all the way up to the, the end of that little section, because I was like, damn it. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't stop yet. <laughs> so Evelyn Hinton, um, it's called Lightning in a Saddle, and it, it's been optioned by Hollywood. I wrote it as a screenplay while I was writing the book. The book is done. It's in COVID jail until I can tour it for Random House. And uh, but people can buy the advanced reader's edition at some point. Well, they can buy it now and get it and read the, uh, the advanced proof of it before it comes out in hardcover. So I'm going to keep you talking for a little bit. That's okay. Sure. So, I'm good. So the first time I got your book, I was like, what the heck is this? Because it didn't <laughs> say bicycle on it. And I'm like, <laughs> at a bike spot me, and this guy hands me a cowboy book. And I'm like, what? Why, <laughs> why does he think I want to read a cowboy book? And then I started reading. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. Where did, <laughs> where, where did you get start calling yourself the, the metal cowboy? Well, I didn't. I mean, you know, there's there's ego. And then there's pompacity, you know, I mean, there's just ridiculousness. I didn't give myself the name. I got the name along the way. It was, I could tell that story real quick, abbreviated version of it, of how I got the name Metal Cowboy, because it's perfect for the, what I do. You know, I tell stories, I ride all, I rode a bike all over the world, and I bring back the stories as seen from the saddle of a metal steed. And so, um... Metal Cowboy was just the right vibrations of a word for what I do. The name found me in Idaho uh, one morning at 5 a.m. on a little town called Pocatella. I was at a stoplight waiting for the light to change from red to green. It was just a one-horse town at the time back in the uh, late 80s and still, like I think, a two-light town now. At any rate, this old rancher comes ambling up you know, long coat, tobacco stains, and cow spittle all over his, his coat, and he's tap, tap, tapping towards me, a little uh, cane in his hand, a uh, 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 feeler, and he taps that cane right over me at the stoplight and back over the other side. He says, ah! Through a mile of busted gravel teeth, he says, ah, metal cowboy. Because he couldn't see me. He was a blind old guy, and he, he could only feel the bike and me, and to him... With my trusted old steed and the asphalt, my dusty trail, and I was like, "Damn, that's right. That that nailed that one." So it stuck, you know. And after all these miles, it's uh, you know, it's been on marquees all over the world, and and it's made a career for me. And it's um, you know, it's still ridiculous that people will pay to come hear me talk about my stories. But that old guy knew what he was talking about. And you don't just write about cowboys. 
no, no, I'm an aging <laughs> surfer looking guy. You know, I mean, I mean, if you saw me, there's no hat, there's no belt buckle, there's no boots. But, um, but I think the crossover there is that I write stories, personal stories with the universal about the universal condition. You know, you try and go out there and bring back, leave out the boring stuff. You know, my books aren't journals, and you've read them, Tom. So you know they're not. They jump all over the place. They jump all over the world. One minute you're riding with me and a guy who's got something in a cooler that he won't show me. Um, the next you're uh, you're going to the prom with a girl that uh, biked into town and found out her story and that she had had to leave school early because of a pregnancy and uh, and here she was working in a factory and getting her high school diploma, but she couldn't go back to her prom alone. So I escorted her. That's a chapter called uh, uh, The Hokey Pokey. So, you know, I've chased by an elephant in Zimbabwe on bike. It's just all kinds of good trouble around the globe. I guess my biggest compliment for you is just um, your stories stay with a person. And I might not be able to index them off the top of my head entirely, but what happens is, is when you're on one of those long roads by yourself, and there's nobody out in sight, there's no other cyclists around, you feel like you're with somebody else, not just you, but it's like those stories that you share help to remind you that there's been other people in that situation before, and there'll be other people in that situation Hmm. again. And it gives you a kind of confidence out there a little bit. I remember one of them that I just wanted, a metaphoric group ride. The stream of the past, the stream of the future, the stream of the present, but one of those books that when when I think about reading, I, I go back to, uh, I don't remember what book it was in. I just remember you were talking about an older gentleman who was riding with you. And you were younger and he was older. And just how that dynamic of you getting information from him reflecting on what it's like to be a few years older and just being able to identify with we're all getting older. Sure. <laughs> we're all going to be Gordy. there someday. Someday Gordy. we're going to. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I remember that story. Gordy, he was the guy in the parka with the frying pan on the back of his bike and just bird dogging me up the sides of the mountains. And then they got to the top of the hill and, and I, I rolled up a few moments later. This guy's got to have me by years. And he said, oh, I was a bear before my knees went back in the 70s. And I thought to myself, if he was a bear then, what am I right now? (laughs) (laughs) My books aren't about being a a spandex roadie or a mountain biker or a touring cyclist. People that have never ridden a bike will pick up my books and they'll email me and say, you know, I finished your book. I want to go for a ride. I want to learn how to ride. And one of the most amazing stories for me was an email I got. I got an email from a woman, and she said, look, somebody gave me your book, and I weighed about 600 pounds. And I read your book, and I said to myself, next year, I'm going to go, I'm going to bicycle to my family reunion we have in New Orleans. I hadn't been in years. I hadn't left my house. And she got a special stationary bike with a special seat for her to train on. And slowly and slowly and slowly, she worked her way to where she could ride a regular bike out in the world. And it took her two years. She had to miss the reunion the year the year that she planned on it. But she got down 400, 300. She got down around 200 pounds and rode across America to her family reunion. And for me, to get, I was just in tears because you don't know what you do when you put out stuff into the creative universe. You don't know. You, you try and be truthful. You try and be authentic. You try and tell. You try and entertain and maybe share a few truths of your own life, uh, hoping they'll connect with somebody else. But for me to hear that that she rolled up to her family reunion on a bicycle, forever changed whether and the weight was the least of it you know she was she was changed in her her approach to life um right there that's all of it right there 
Okay, well, I highly recommend to my listeners, if you've never read any of the Metal Cowboys books, uh, that you do uh, a dive in on any one of those to start off with. The new book sounds great. And there's so many other folks out there roaming the world and, you know, either telling their stories or they should be telling their stories. And it's a privilege to have you doing the show to share some of other people's stories out there, too, because, uh, you know, if we could just get ourselves slowed down and listen, we're dead either way, Tom. We're dead either way in this world. So live fiercely, live fearlessly and live for each other, you know, and if we can tell some of those stories to each other, I think it, it, it helps. So if people want to go and read some of your books or follow you on social media or find out about the new book, where would they go? Go to metalcowboy.com, and a piece of it, each sale goes to our uh, nonprofit Washco Bikes. And that way you get a signed first edition or reprint uh, edition of any of my books. You can also get the advanced readers edition by buying the pre-order of uh of lightning a saddle that way you get the you get the actual book when it drops the hardcover but now right now you'll get a preview copy online you know you get your P- pdf as they say as the, as the kids say on the interwebs um you know hey tom I, I you know it's nice to speak to one of my tribe and uh you know pedal on brother it's great talking to you and we'll talk to you again soon All right. So look for the second installment of Joe's storytelling in a future episode. Good day, this is Rowan de Bonaire of the Velocipedium here in Lancashire, England. I'm here to remind you always to do your ABC quick check before every ride, no matter how short. So here we go. A is for air. Check those tyres, which is spelt with a Y, by the way. B is for brakes. C is for your chain. And quick is your quick release or your wheel nuts. Just check that those wheels are going to stay where they belong. Thank you, Tom. And here's wishing you all tailwinds and joyful cycling. Toodle pip. Welcome to Mid-Roll Gratitude. This is the point in the show that I like to give thanks to anybody who's helped. Whether you've shared a story, passed out some stickers, written a nice review, told some friends about the show, or that you even bothered to just listen when I put out a new episode. Thanks. When you follow on wherever you listen to us, it really does help to raise the show in the search results. So I want to go ahead and thank Bobo Bingo 96 for following on Podbean. Rose M. Quinn, thank you for following. Kizibwe Viani and Swampo, thank you very much for following on Podbean. For leaving a nice review on Apple Media, I'd like to thank Niles D. Thanks to the folks at Ragbri for reposting some of my stuff. Thanks to all the people who responded to the Ragbri story and said that they were going to give it a try at some point. That felt really good to give people something new to put on their bucket list. It's kind of cool. Thanks to all the folks that requested stickers. Responsibly sticking and sharing them around the world is one of the ways the show has organically grown. Can't believe we're in all 50 states and over 90 countries. And a large part of that growth is just people sharing stickers on a group ride or telling friends about the show when they're out riding. Thankful to all the folks on Patreon including new Patreons Niles Deweys and Dave McGowan. 
For as little as a dollar a month, you can help support the show. Frees me up to pay for hosting and get the latest round of stickers produced, of which I'd like to give a shout out to my kids, who are my main marketing department. The folks at Patreon help to make it so that whenever anybody asks for free stickers, I can send them anywhere all over the world. And so I'm very grateful for their support. If you'd like to check it out, just go to Patreon and search up Bike Karma. And if you would like stickers or to share a story or perhaps just to say hey, you can contact me at bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. That's bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. And as usual, I'd like to give a big thank you to Fred Thomas from The Frame and Wheel. Fred has a couple of businesses. One's 80 bikes. He used to race on Ostra Daimler bikes back when he was younger. They were an amazing brand that made some amazing bikes. And as you can hear on one of the early episodes, it kind of broke his heart when the company was no longer active. So he bought the name and restarted the company. He's had amazing offerings in both carbon and steel, and the killer retro futuristic graphics are something you should go check out. But the other business is the primary sponsor of the show. It's the Frame and Wheel. Everyone who enjoys bicycles has something that they aren't using. Whether it's a pair of tires that just didn't work out, or a frame that you fell in love with but never built up. Maybe you bought some parts for an upgrade and never got around to it. Or maybe you have a whole bicycle hanging in the garage. And while you feel guilty looking at it when you go out every day, you just like your other bike better. Well, Fred can take all of these items and more and turn them into more time, space, and cash. He's an expert at it. And I am aware of no time in my life where it would be a better time to sell your quality used bicycles, parts, and accessories. You might be saying to yourself, well, why do I need Fred? Why do I need the frame and wheel to do it? Let's just be totally honest about it. If you didn't need help doing it, you would have already done it. There's just some part of doing this whole thing that you aren't going to do. Maybe you're apprehensive about dealing with the different people. Maybe you don't know exactly how to price things. Maybe you took a couple pictures intending to list them, but then they looked really bad. Maybe you started looking up fee structures on websites to sell stuff, and their policies and their fees started to just either confuse you or sucked all the wind out of your sales. Fred at the Frame and Wheel is an expert. He is packing up stuff all the time. Taking in, researching, photographing, shipping and sending, dealing with people and getting it done. Fred knows the ups and downs of the market during these difficult times. He knows what things have skyrocketed in price and what things haven't. Take a look at one of his listings. The pictures look amazing and his descriptions are complete. So rather than just have that stuff laying around, imagining that someday you're going to do it, contact Fred Thomas at the Frame and Wheel now and let him get you more time, space, and cash. Looking for stuff to buy? Is your bike shop out of everything or have back orders for the stuff you want? Go to the Frame and Wheel and buy with confidence. Fred's a nice, approachable guy. Just go to the Frame and Wheel website. Contact him to get the conversation going. Give him a follow on any of the social media and say, Hey Fred, thanks for helping to support the Bike Karma podcast. Now, back to the show. There are so many differences between the different people who may listen to this show, but the mission is to share stories and make connections between all those different types of people from all over the world. To understand that the other human beings riding on a seemingly similar path as you might be having a very different experience may at first seem to separate us, but it could also be a chance to understand our deeper connections through listening and learning. Riding a bicycle? is a great way to experience history, and having a guided bicycle tour based upon black history is a brilliant way to learn. So when I realized that the first black history bike ride was going to have hundreds of people attend it, um, I really remembered that I am not necessarily someone that likes to be in the spotlight or the center of attention. 
but I realized that this project was a way for me to help amplify the voices of the black community of all of these people and families that I've actually never even met. But, you know, in that moment, I realized that if I was able to use my voice to amplify theirs, then it was 100% something I needed to do, even though I'm not someone that likes to be on a microphone in front of a large group of people. All of that anxiety and, and nervousness about being on a mic in front of people kind of vanished because it, it felt like something I had to do. My name is Talib Abdullahi. I founded a project called the Black History Bike Ride, and I love to ride bikes and travel around. Early last June, I think it was June 6th or June 7th, there was, there had been a series of, of large protests and a local chapter of the Austin Justice Coalition had planned a large rally at Houston Tillotson that marched, you know, downtown towards the, the capital of Texas here in Austin. We'd had weeks of, of really chaotic, kind of intense rioting happening in town here in Austin. And uh, that rally was both peaceful and there were at least 10,000 people there. There was a huge amount of attention and traction from the community. I had been to some of the other protests happening in Austin. And while I completely support and agree with what's happening, you know, part of me felt like a lot of this intense energy that people had in, in the wake of George Floyd's death and people's, um, how upset they were with the police and everything was the right energy, but I, I kind of found that maybe it'll be helpful if, if there's this much energy and people are just concerned about social justice and bringing to light a lot of these you know, problems that we're having in society today. I kind of was like, you know, how, how many how many of these folks understand or, or know how this, the way society has kind of performed to behave in this way? Like, how many people know that this has basically occurred in our city in a very visible, obvious way for many years? And after talking to a lot of my friends, my, my personal friends who, you know, I have friends of all different backgrounds and colors, and, you know, lots of, of white friends in town, um, a lot of people didn't really know. A lot of my, my black and Latino friends didn't really know about our own city's history and its own problems with societal or, or just institutional racist problems. So I put out after this huge rally at uh, Houston Tilson, historically back college, uh, I put out my personal Instagram that I wanted to lead a black history bike ride. I am someone that has been an avid cyclist my whole life. Since I was a young child, I've, I've been riding, raced BMX as a kid, then raced state-sanctioned mountain bike races, you know, as a teenager. And so cycling's always been a huge, huge, huge passion of mine. And I also, you know, graduated American Studies degree, which is sort of like an interdisciplinary history and English degree from the university here in town. My idea was really just to kind of merge two things I understood really well, it's riding bikes and understanding our history. And so I, I put that idea out on my own personal Instagram. And um, a friend of mine who is a designer who is, you know, not working was like, hey, I'd love to design a poster for this. And within you know, 24 hours of putting it on my personal Instagram, she had made a poster and I was like, cool, I'll share this too. And that started getting shared and people started posting about it on Facebook and it was, you know, kind of a mixture of things because my original intention was just to lead a bike ride with maybe a dozen or two dozen of my friends and their friends. And uh, it snowballed into this thing that just started getting shared many, many times online. And on the day of the event, I had only put the idea out there a week before, but we had about 400 people on bikes meet me. And a group of volunteers I'd asked to help kind of at the last minute, people helping lead the ride and, and helping make sure the group obeys traffic laws and make sure we're not just this ridiculous, huge mass of riders, you know, everywhere, uh, all over the streets. And uh, yeah, yeah, um, myself and a lot of these volunteers from these local cycling clubs really stepped up and we, we had this huge Black History ride. That was basically how this whole thing started. That was June of, of last year, which really uh, really only seven months ago, you know? I think, to, to be honest, up until maybe a couple years ago, I was really aware of sort of, I'll just say the racial disparity in cycling, which I would say is a kind of a greater racial disparity in other action and outdoor sports, such as snowboarding, skiing. There's, there's kind of a huge racial, um, or just lack of people of color in a lot of those sports. In cycling, though, there there are, in, in different realms of cycling, there are lots of people of color riding. They just aren't the most visible. 
my own personal experience kind of with a what I would say is unjust racial treatment while cycling uh, happened when I was about 20 years old. I used to frequent some of the local critical mass rides. Yeah, so critical mass, they they don't really have too many of them in Austin quite as often anymore, but um, the critical mass rides that did occur and, you know, I was 20 years old, they were, they were definitely bike rides, similar to kind of like large social rides, and they would happen once a month, I believe, on like the first Friday around like five o'clock. And they were somewhat a like a rolling protest, at, at least the people leading the rides in Austin were sort of, you know, very pro-cycling and anti-car culture. And so it was this sort of small section of the cycling world's protest against this gridlock car culture. You know, when you're 20 years old and riding a sixty, you're like, hey, that sounds like a lot of fun. It was, they were just fun rides to go on. There were like definitely some shenanigans that would happen on those rides. A lot of people rolling stop signs and, and stop lights and, and, and everything, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't seem like that big of an issue. But I had probably been going to those rides for like six months, like once a month. And at some point, the police had decided to kind of crack down on these rides. And keep in mind, the rides consist probably, I would say the ratio of black and Hispanic people to white people in the rides is like, you know, maybe a a quarter of the riders are people of color and the rest of the riders are young white kids. And essentially on the the last ride that I went on, we had made like a, a stop in a park and kind of had hung out for a while for probably half an hour, 45 minutes. And as we were riding back up north, uh, on one of the main streets in Austin on Congress, the police had kind of set up this, I wouldn't say block the street, but they had gotten on all four corners and uh, essentially decided that they were going to shut this ride down or try to disperse this crowd of, of cyclists. There were probably about 300 cyclists there. So it was kind of a chaotic moment, but that was the first and only time I've ever been arrested. Um, And I was basically riding my bike up Congress Avenue, uh, the main street in Austin, one of the main streets in Austin, wasn't breaking any traffic laws. I believe the lights were green and, uh, you know, I was arrested. And in the whole moment of everything, you know, all the cyclists, other cyclists are like, you know, this person wasn't doing anything wrong. Why are you doing this? And the police had really nothing to say. So anyway, I went to jail and I spent the night in jail and my friend Samir actually <laughs> bailed me out. It's kind of funny. I could see him from the window of the jail and I couldn't say anything to him because I was several floors up. But that was a very, you know, intense, uncomfortable, scary experience. Um, I was asked by several people who were in jail, like what I was in for. And I was like, I was riding my bike and the cops didn't like it and they arrested me. Lo and behold, once I got out, fortunately I was only there for, for like 24 hours, but once I got out of there, I found out that I wasn't the only other person who was arrested. Uh, three other people were arrested and they were all Latino people. So that was like, you know, in terms of a just cycling, my perspective on fairness and cycling and, and how the local police handled it, um, I can say with a lot of confidence that the majority of the, those riders there were, they were white kids and four people out of a group of hundreds um, that are arrested all end up being black and brown people, that that does seem pretty suspicious to me, you know? To, to answer your question, that's that's the best example I can give and is a, a firsthand experience. You know, like when I'm out riding my bike, I am very aware of, of my race and who I am, but deep down, I still have sort of that, that feeling you have when, you know, you're a kid and you're riding and it's like, I don't, I'm just a human being on a bike and I'm just enjoying myself and I'm I'm just getting from point A to point B or I'm just riding around for fun. You don't really want to have to think about how the color of your skin can can be a target or be something that singles you out in in the eyes of a a police officer or someone that just hasn't realized or, or, or doesn't want to accept that you're just a human being having fun on a bike, you know? I'm sorry that happened to you. It really gives insight into someone's actual experience and and how unfair that is. If you were randomly and unbiasedly picking people out of a giant crowd, the odds of just randomly having that selection, so it, it 
just basically proves that things have a long way to go. True. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even in that kind of scenario, in that group of people at the time, I think most of them are not doing that anymore. You know, we're not having rides of that caliber anymore. But most of the people that are like encouraging everyone to break the traffic laws and like blocking the blocking the lights so all the cyclists can go uh, on a green, you know, blocking the cars and stuff. It's, it's usually young know, white kids, you know, like very there's definitely a very punk rock attitude about it. So, um, you know, it's there's a lot that could be said. You know, people of color and black history is American history. Where do you start with this? Is is there a timeline that you work within? Are there events that go back and forth? Is it chronological? Is it just based on the place or how how do you set up these these rides? Yeah, we've we've done essentially in Austin we've kind of built off of this first route that we've we've done. And so the rough framework of, of the timeline that we try to explain is really teaching people, and this is one of my favorite parts and most interesting parts, and, and honestly one of the parts that probably is, you know, the hardest for us to research or, or find a lot of real substantive history about. Um, we start with the freedmen's communities that formed right after the Civil War in Texas and in a lot of places in the South. There are these old, old areas that were the first places that free slaves started to settle and try to build their lives. Typically, in, in Austin, if I think of Clarksville, that area was formerly the actual slave quarters for uh, a plantation that is nearby. And so the plantation owner essentially, I think for some of the sl- some of the former slaves, he gave them the gave them the land if they agreed to still work for him, and then he sold them the land to, to others. I would like to think equitably and not at a really expensive rate, but that's kind of where we start our rides with the Freedmen's communities because it's really fascinating for us to look at where where these areas were and to really understand their significance. I say that because, you know, a lot of those areas now have been completely raised over. So you wouldn't be able to recognize it as a former a neighborhood that, that three slaves have lived in. Luckily, we have at least a couple in Austin that you – there's still some visible signs that there, there was a Freedmen's community. And Clarksville is a, a great example of that because they have preserved a couple of the buildings there that have been there literally since, like, the 1870s. Who do you want to go on these tours? What's the mission of doing these tours? Who, who I want going on the rides is essentially anyone who has a bike and is interested in learning, you know, I'm, I'm not someone that's trying to force people that don't want to learn something to go out there, although they probably should. But since we have really gotten this, you know, gotten a lot of support and attention behind this project, the idea now is to sort of create a really awesome website that's engaging and easy for people to use to access this history. So essentially we're, we're trying to make this sort of an open platform for people to engage with this history. A lot of that has to do with the fact that most of this history already exists. A lot of the things that I source are like the Texas State Historical Handbook, which has all of its articles online, and Wikipedia, you know, for a lot of the figures. So in a way, all of this history exists. We're trying to put it together in a way that is easy for people to understand and easily accessible and kind of cool looking, you know, because... When the conversation comes up that, you know, oh, people need to do their research and they need to they need to educate themselves, what that looks like, although extremely important and I'm not discrediting this at all, I think for some people, you know, the idea of figuring out how to learn about black history and just history in general is to crack open a giant, thick history textbook like you'd have in, in grade school or in high school. And I think a lot of people have like this really uh, negative connotation towards that, or it's not something that people are eager to go do. The focus of this project is to kind of highlight local histories because that's really fascinating for people. I mean, it's fascinating for me. I'm, I'm someone that loves history, but even when you start to explain to people, hey, there was a Freedmen's community right here, and you can point out to the buildings where the groups of organizers were organizing or trying to organize the desegregation of schools. And when you, you point that out to people on a bike ride, or even just if you're walking through town, you know, like, hey, you know, in, in this building, there were dozens of 
you know, teachers and even senators and people in the city council who worked for, you know, decades to desegregate schools. And you think about how impactful that was and how we don't even think about that today. And also about how, you know, that only happened like, what, like 70, 60, 70 years ago? Like it, it happened so recently that it, it's not too far gone. It's not like it happened 500 years ago. It actually happened almost within a lifespan of where we're sitting. And so that's part and parcel why it's, I think it's important just to, to continue talking about it, basically to anyone who's, who's interested. And once we started to pique people's interest and, and get them kind of interested, we started to realize that people really do want to learn. It's just, it's, it's how we are describing this history and the way in which we, we teach it and, and working to teach it in a way that's very, uh, accessible, super accessible to people. So we don't assume that they understand anything and we don't also don't really try to lop them over the head with judgments. You know, we certainly could do that because once you get to the point where you really understand this stuff, it feels like, hey, man, like, feels like everyone should know this. So, yeah, we, we, we just try to be very equitable and, and, and make the information accessible. It's kind of a natural for bike riding because when you're riding a bike, your brain is blank or wanders or whatever. And if you stop at a place and somebody tells you an interesting story about our history, and then on your way to the next place, that's resonating and going through your head over and over again. It gives you some quality time to actually take it in and to try and understand it, comprehend what that was like. Right. You know, after the first ride, when we had so many people come, one of my best friends, one of, you know, the first friends I've ever, I ever made in Austin came. He and his wife came as partner, and uh, they are both teachers for the Austin Independent School District. His partner mentioned afterwards that she was like, you know, I, I grew up here, and both of them have lived in Austin their whole lives. And she was like, I've heard small bits and pieces of a couple of these things, but I had no idea that there was this much history here. And she really owned up to it. She was like, I'm a teacher and I teach kids every day and I teach kids history often. And I am both glad that, that I've had the opportunity to learn, but also a little shocked at how naive I could have been. She mentioned it was like a, a good invitation to not be so naive, which really resonated just because when you leave the rides, you really have no idea how much people understand and it, it, it's the, the more I do this it's becoming clear that most people I, I feel like I don't understand a whole lot and when I explain just a little bit I know to other people it seems like it's already uh, quite a bit or it, it's enough information that those folks are, are quite surprised and really engaged which is both uh, it, it's refreshing but it's it seems like there could be a lot more that we're, we're talking about you know so that that definitely that definitely really stuck out. I think this whole experience has proven to me that to inspire some change in, in society or even just locally, like in your neighborhood or community, it can just take one person with an idea, kind of kind of like I had. I, I would hope, you know, that if other people feel inspired by this, that they can know that they, they themselves, too, can, like, help amplify voices of, of their own communities where they are, because I certainly, you know, it, it, this has proven to me that it's completely possible I would say a lot of this happens kind of by accident. Uh, it wasn't a pre-planned, hey, we're going to launch a Black History bike ride, and then I'll be talking to, you know, all these podcasts. That was not at all the, the idea. But uh, I think it's important for people to remember, you know, I'm, I'm just a regular guy with a bike, and uh, I just had an idea, and uh, it, it I guess it worked. <laughs> it was something that people responded really positively to, and I'm grateful that the community responded like it did, and it's, it's been working out. Another thing I would like to add uh, for anyone else listening to the podcast today is that, you know, we are looking for volunteers, no matter what your background or level of writing ability or historical knowledge. Uh, so if you are interested in volunteering and, and being an ambassador for the ride, we are definitely interested in, in helping piece together other types of black history rides in different cities. Um, it's a pretty easy process, really. And for most folks that I think that live in other cities, it, it should hopefully be a pretty simple thing. So if anyone is interested in helping be an ambassador and putting together roots in any city in the United States, feel free to reach out our website or Instagram or email, and we'd, we'd love to talk about how to help set those up. Our website is blackhistorybikeride.com, and our Instagram handle is blackhistorybikeride. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Just a 
postcard from the trails. Mountain biking at Connecticut River Highlands with my good friend Falky. Come here, Fox. And about 8,000 mosquitoes that have just decided to befriend me. Connecticut River Highland is one of those places where you could slather yourself with three different types of insect repellent and they're still gonna come at you like you rubbed yourself in bacon grease or whatever they would like you to rub yourself in. It's great mountain biking in the summer in Connecticut, especially on nice trails like here at Connecticut River Highlands. I just saw a barred owl, which was great. Flew from the tree, you know, sometimes when you look quick, you can't tell if it's a hawk or if it's an owl. But as soon as it was flying, it was just dead quiet. I came to a complete stop immediately and just heard nothing, no flittering of the wings, which is, which is a sign of the owl. And then when it landed, I could see the round shape of the head and got up close to it. And me and Falk stood up and had a moment, our spirit animal for today's ride, barred owl. But yeah, cycling with a dog is kind of fun. We play a game called don't hit me, but keep moving. Isn't that right? He has lots of nice streams to go dive into periodically. We make sure that the loops we're taking go by them. They can fully immerse himself in water and have a little drink. The streams are a little bit cleaner than the Connecticut River, if not a lot. You see some trees down occasionally. It's just a beautiful time mountain biking here in Connecticut. One of my favorite segments at Connecticut River Highlands Park is a little segment called the self-esteem check. It's a climb I've been doing since I was in my 30s. Now that I'm pretty close to 50, I won't tell you which side I'm on of that, but still able to do that, even though it almost killed me. Right, Fluff? Falky was concerned he might have to give me doggy CPR, but no, I did it, so it's good. All right, let's keep rolling. So if you're a road biker, borrow somebody's mountain bike, get out into the woods. If you're a mountain biker, borrow somebody's road bike, get out onto some nice quiet roads, tool around some suburban neighborhoods, do some hill work. It's fun to mix it up. Just a summer 2021 postcard from the trails. Well, you've gotten to the end of another episode of the Bike Karma Bicycle and Cycling Stories podcast. I'd like to thank all the guests on today's show shared stories. And as always, Keller Glass and the band Mobjack for our theme music, which this time comes through a little teeny speaker on the beach. Still sounds great, though. You can check them out at mobjackmusic.com or check out Keller Glass for some of his newer stuff. Keller and I met through a mutual friend and an interest in bikes, and an interview with him is coming up soon. All the other music used in the show is royalty-free, and I thank those musicians as well. If you have any questions, comments, ideas for stories, maybe you're wondering if I actually did record this on the beach or if I'm just using sound effects, you can email me at bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. That's bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. The Bike Karma Podcast, apart from the music, is the intellectual property of Thomas Brown. All rights, including copyrights and trademarks, are reserved and asserted. I hope you liked my subliminal hint that you should go to the beach if that's something you enjoy. It's a reminder to myself to get out to the beach more as well. Just like how this show makes you realize that you're not the only one tinkering with bike parts in your basement or going on rides and thinking about this and that, if you think you're alone out there with your feelings about all the craziness that's been happening in the world, you are not. While everybody does experience things in their own way, there's a lot of people out there who are emotionally fatigued as well. So be kind to yourself about it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Talk to your friends and family when you're struggling. 
If there's one takeaway that I'd really love for people to get from this show is that you're not alone with the bicycle stuff and you're not alone with the other stuff as well. Anyway, I hope you have a great month until the next episode drops. And until then, keep it wheeled.